Okay, go live. Good afternoon. I'm Ian Bruce, Executive Coordinator and Co-Founder of Peninsula Stream Society. I hope you enjoy today's webinar. It's the fourth in our series. Penn Streams has been active in the community since 2002, educating children, restoring and conserving habitats, and providing opportunities for people to learn about and actively help their watersheds. Using streams of knowledge, expertise, energy, and action, we help protect and restore Greater Victoria and Saanich Peninsula watersheds and near shore marine habitats. Our motto, Headwaters to Deep Waters, reflects a close relationship between the land, streams, and the marine waters. And as ecologists, we recognize the interconnectivity of these ecosystems. Our school environmental education programs are intended to instill hope and inspiration in children about their future through understanding and personal action. Our numerous volunteers work on watersheds and beaches all over the CRD, for this webinar, we'll focus on the Todd Creek watershed. I'd also like to acknowledge with respect the indigenous people on whose property and traditional territory we operate, Liguangan speaking Songhees and Esquimalt and the Sinchathan speaking Wasanish people whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. Now I'm gonna turn this over to Brian and he's gonna say a few words. Hi everyone, and I'm Brian Koval, the Biological Coordinator with Peninsula Stream Society. And I'd just like to recognize today's sponsor, which is RBS Seafood Harvesting Limited. Now, RBS have over 30 years experience in seafood harvesting off the coast of British Columbia, Canada. Uh, some of the harvesting methods uh, include diving, trapping, and trolling. So yeah, so RBS Seafood works closely with the Department of Fisheries in Canada, acquiring scientific data for research of sustainability for the products that they harvest. And the efforts they put in today, well, they guarantee a product into the future. Now, before we step into the webinar, I just like to mention that if you have any questions, please put it in the Q&A section of the webinar. And I'd like to invite you to please enjoy today's webinar on the Todd Creek Watershed. Well, hello, my name is Ian Bruce and I'm the Executive Coordinator of Peninsula Stream Society. And today we're bringing you the fourth webinar in our series, this one on Todd Creek Watershed. I'd just like to give another shout out to RBS Seafood Harvesting Limited, which is our sponsor for this webinar. And if you look at the photo on the right, you'll see some happy volunteers uh, from the Friends of Todd Creek Watershed and Peninsula Streams who are out releasing coho on Todd Creek Flats. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, here we go. So the webinar forecast is for bus tours leading into uh, different parts of the, of the watershed and ending up at deep waters at Todd Inlet. On the right here, you'll see uh, some people releasing coho and they're into the main stem at the Hills Rifle Range. And in the foreground, you'll see Tiffany Joseph who's a young Sinchathan speaking uh, leader of the Wasanich First Nations. And she gave a blessing and sang a song to the fish to help them on their way, which was awesome. All right, so we're going to move on to a map here of the Todd Creek watershed in, in with respect to the other watersheds, the CRD. And the ones with arrows are ones that we've worked on or continue to work on. So uh, we're talking about Todd. So let's move on to the next slide, which is another map. So this map has got colors on it. The green being forest, which is a good thing. So much of the watershed is forested and yellow would be agricultural land and blue is water. Now, just something to note is up on the left-hand side is a light green area. That's Heartland Landfill. 
So uh, we'll be talking more about that later. Okay. So this is the first bus tour we had. It was in 2016, and uh, it was well-received, and it was a lot of fun. And it was in the community bus, and we went from headwaters to deep waters. So this presentation's following the route of the bus. And our first stop is at Maltby Lake. Maltby Lake is uh, the top of the watershed. It's the furthest south. And um, the couple that live on it, um, Carmel Thompson, you can see there addressing the, the group from the bus, and her husband, Woody Thompson. They live on the lake. They look after the lake. Um, they form the Friends of Maltby Lake Watershed Society in order to help protect the lake. And they're doing everything they can to keep it in its pristine condition. So here we have an aerial picture of Maltby Lake looking east. And we're going to now show a little bit of a video. Here we go. This is some drone footage brought by uh, Mike Derry, who's the vice chair of Peninsula Streams, with his new toy. And here we go. So we're, again, heading down the lake, heading east and I just like to say that the Maltby Lake is surrounded by 172 acres of, of forest and it uh, largely intact. The water quality in the lake is really good. It has freshwater jellyfish and sponges which are uh, unusual. And you can see there the little the, the outlet from Maltby going down into a little pot lake called Philippa Lake and now we're looking north uh, towards Prospect Lake. Okay, here we go. So, uh, Maltby Lake, uh, the Friends of Maltby Lake Watershed Society has volunteer events, and this one was aimed at pulling red flag, uh, sorry, yellow flag iris in September 2019 with volunteers from Peninsula Streams, Friends of Todd Creek Watershed, and uh, UVic, and of course the Maltby Lake group. Oh, there we go. And we have Keith Chancellor, uh, the 2020 uh, Volunteer of the Year for Peninsula Streams. Hard at work as usual, but uh, finding he might have hit his Waterloo with yellow flag iris. It's a tough job. It's a tough plant. All right, now we're going to go into an aerial to uh, re reorient ourselves, and you see Maltby, and then uh, Philippa, Philippa Lake, and then we're going downstream in Bleathman Creek to the uh, Prospect Lake here, and this is the old golf course, Prospect Lake Golf Course, and up here is Whitehead Park and the outlet uh, Todd, where Todd Creek starts, and we'll be talking about that in a minute. But first, we're going to go to a video of the Whitehead Park area. And this is the public dock, and we're gonna uh, pull out and uh, look at the park. Now, the Friends of Todd Creek Watershed have had regular Monday morning work parties to uh, restore Whitehead Park by removing invasive species such as golden willow, English hawthorn, blackberries, yellow flag iris, and more, and replanting them with native plants. So we'll talk about that a little bit right now. So here we go. We've got Mary Haig Brown, Sharon McPherson, and Winona Pugh uh, with a big pile of blackberries um, and other invasive species that they've cleared out. And uh, the Sandwich Parks comes along and picks up that debris and gets rid of it. So they've been really supportive of the efforts of the Friends of Todd Creek Watershed in restoring the park, uh, Whitehead Park. That's back in 2010. So now we've got uh, uh, further along in the process. Now we're at the point where they're planting. And a lot of native plants went in. And again, Sandwich helped with providing plants and mulch um, and some expertise as far as uh, where to plant and, and, and that. So Sandwich Parks did a great job of supporting our stewards at. Prospect Lake. And here's a, a group of the planting uh, that went into the major planting that day. And the Friends of Todd Creek Watershed take the opportunity to 
um, talk about what they do in uh, public events at Whitehead Park. So showing people what they've done, talking about native plants, talking about invasive plants, and hopefully at the same time, generating new volunteers. And here's Audrey Barnes and a big smile for the uh, camera. So now we're going to go on to talk about Meadowbrook, Killarney Lake, and Killarney Creek. So uh, Killarney Lake drains down through here to uh, uh, Meadowbrook and then Meadowbrook's got a reservoir up here and it comes down past, past this farm and then past Bernie and Mary's place which is which is right here, and into Prospect Lake. So here we have another aerial uh, drone footage of Killarney Lake. And if you look in behind, that's the landfill. So that's Heartland Road there, uh, Heartland Road landfill. And um, yeah, looking, I guess you're looking pretty well northwest at this point in time. All right, so part of the restoration we've done uh, in the watershed with, with the Friends of Todd Creek Watershed um, has been adding rock and gravel um, to pr support spawning populations of coho when they get back and, and cutthroat trout um, in the meantime. So if you look at the photo on the, le on the right, you'll see volunteer Colin G Dower waiting for the delivery of buckets of gravel from Bernie Boker. Um, whose Kubota has come in very handy. And if you look on the left, you'll see the gravel that's been put in behind the uh, riffle that was built uh, using using native rock that was already there. And that's why the rocks look black. They're stained with, um, with algae. Okay. And uh, we take the opportunity when we can to put on Streamkeeper's course. And this course is put on by Dave Clough, who's shown pointing at the, um, at the turbidity meter. Um, and uh, Dave is a stream restoration biologist par none, and uh, we use him a lot in our projects. And he's a great Streamkeeper uh, trainer, and he trained Brian to um, do his Streamkeeping. Courses. Okay, great. And everybody having some fun. Okay, now we're going to talk about the uh, reach of Todd Creek between uh, Lower Road and Heartland Avenue. We built six riffles in that uh, uh, in that reach. And here we go. We've got uh, our arborist, uh, Nigel Rammer. You can see him on the right, that orange dot up in the tree. And Walter, the excavator operator, um, helping out by hanging on to the, the tree during the process of taking it down. This was a very quite a large golden willow, invasive uh, species, that had uh, started growing in the creek in this location. And its roots had built up the level of the creek by a meter. So we needed to take this out for a number of different reasons. And once it came out, that gave us a meter of elevation in order to build riffles upstream. So that's what we did. So we built four riffles uh, in this reach using the, the, the one meter that the, the root ball had been uh, uh, holding back. So we made 20, four 25 centimeter riffles. And we reached in very carefully with the, with the excavator to bring the rock in so that um, we didn't damage the alder trees there. All right, now we're going to uh, orient our orient ourselves a little bit more. We're going to talk about Todd Flats, and uh, we did a significant um, project there. And for reference, there's the Red Barn Market. Many of you shop there, I believe, and um, a shout out to them. They've been supportive of, of us over the years, and that's great. So here we go. And so in the late teens of, uh, so 2016 to 2018, we did a series of projects with Fisheries and Oceans Canada to improve the channel and improve fish habitat in Todd Creek. So the flats were um, a problem because the people that were living on this side had noticed that in the springtime, when the water levels dropped, fish were trapped on the flats and then were getting predated upon by raptors. So eagles and ospreys were coming and filling 
themselves up on the fish that were trapped on the flats. So we believe that in order to help the fish get off the flats, they needed some channels to guide them. So there wasn't an existing channel here, um, but we so we built onto that and improved the depth of it, and we built these other channels as ways of fish of to, for fish to get off the flats because they would come in up high here and get onto the flats because it would overflow the banks but they would they would come down in this area and then they couldn't get back over the berm so that's why we opened up these uh, channels put culverts in with head walls to lead the fish off the flats okay and here's a pouring of the head wall so we had to build these head walls at the end of the culverts in order to put screens in and stop logs to control flow in to block fish when we wanted to block them. And here's the uh, head wall being poured there. Again, picture. And so um, with the, the channel, the culvert is blocked off with screens. We directed the fish that were going to migrate off the flats and into the main stem channel and into our traps. So if the theory held uh, correct, then cutthroat trout that were trapped on the flats or coho that had been released or later on that would be wild spawn coho juveniles, if they were on the flats, could they would they get out using the channels that we built uh, for them? So uh, fingers crossed and what we got was exactly that. So this is one of many cutthroat that we got off of the flats it's one of the bigger ones, and it's just gorgeous. Um, so cutthroat trout would have been a bird food if uh, we hadn't done that uh, channel, um, make that project making the channels. And here you go. We've got one of the co smolts that we pre smolts that we released, and it came out through the channel and into the trap just like uh, it was intended. And here's a Grant with a big smile on his face, uh, with a cutthroat and Grant McPherson is a great volunteer with Sydney Anglers and Peninsula Streams and loves being outdoors and in the field. Okay so now we're going to show a video of the flats that was taken uh, this winter just uh, a month or so ago by Mike Derry and uh, over here you'll see Red Barn again this is the the main stem and you can see how um, fish would get out into the flats through this area and then they would just motor around in here so over here you can see a dark uh, dark blue string or uh, that dark there's another channel that we built and they show up below the water this is another channel here and another channel here and the idea was is that as the water dropped they'd be able to find their way out to the main stem and down so we set up traps in this location but mainly this was their main trapping location because that's the that's the direction of the flow <coughs> Okay, and we're just looking downstream a little bit. That's Wallace Drive on the right, and uh, this is West Saanich Road, and this is going up towards Willis Point Road over here. And of course, um, we weren't done there. We had to do some uh, planting because we disturbed the area and we needed to be planted up with native plants. So we love to bring in kids. These are uh, students from Bayside. They're being instructed on proper shovel handling by our horticulturist uh, June Pretzer that works with us on many, many projects, uh, planting the native plants and helping source them and putting them in the ground. And here are the volunteers walking out the flats uh, to release fish in 2018. It was, it was quite something because a lot of the flats were frozen and we were had to be careful where we were releasing them. But... Um, a nice sunny day for heading out onto the flats. So uh, this is a sign that's on the side of West Saanich Road on a path that's just north of the Red Barn. Actually, you can see the Red Barn just in the corner here. So it's a great sign that talks about the flats and its wildlife value and its history um, where it was, it was cleared and farmed by the settlers, I believe by the Sisters of St. Anne um, and at St. Anne's Academy and at the old St. Joseph's Hospital. Anyway, so uh, District of Saanich built this sign for us and it's great and we're very thankful for their support. All right, so and we got some press on this one. You can see um, an article about uh, 
about Todd Creek Flats. You can see our, our biologist, Brian uh, Covell there, standing back and supervising. Um, and so that was in the Sandwich News. All right, so now we're going to move on. Um, I'm going to move uh, downstream a little bit further to Ward Creek. And Ward Creek is just at the, at the confluence of West Saanich Road and um, um, Wallace Drive. Okay, this uh, photo shows clearly what Ward Creek looked like before and looked like after. So Ward Creek was uh, a tributary that is very short, but it still has valuable habitat because it's got some um, elevational change. And in this part of Todd Creek, it's it's quite flat, i.e. the flats. So we built a spawning area just um, just very close to the creek, um, and we utilized the elevation uh, between Wallace Drive and the Todd Creek to do this. So we built about four, I think, four riffles with spawning gravel there. And there's another photo of it with some spawning gravel stockpiled for later and uh, the riffle structures. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, yeah, the Hills Rifle Range and the Todd uh, main stem down there and Durant's Lake and Durant's Creek. So this is a, a, a tributary system that comes down um, through the, rifle range and into Todd Creek proper. All right, so here we are. We have a video, uh, another drone video of Durant's Lake. And here we are, we're looking about due east. And on the right, you can see over here, you can see uh, Willis Point Road. And here's the uh, Heartland Landfill there. And this is the new sludge um, plant to deal with the sludge from the Macaulay Point sewage treatment plant that's just being built. So uh, there's some controversy going on here about biosolids being placed on the pro on the land up here. That's something that CRD said they weren't going to do and they are going to do it. And there's lots of people in the watershed are concerned about the impacts of that activity. All right, so uh, we're going to jump now to outplanting of coho in the d and property upstream and upslope from the rifle range. So here we've got, uh, again, a, a group of volunteers from Peninsula Streams and Goldstream Hatchery and Sydney Anglers. And they're releasing fish um, that were transported from the Goldstream Hatchery uh, in this tank. And, um, oh, and here's a, here's a photo of the area they're releasing in. And this is all natural gravel. We didn't have to bring it in for once. And this is the, kind of the way the creeks should be and used to be. And it's just a beautiful area upstream of the rifle range um, that when you go into it, you just get an idea of how uh, spectacular a lot of these places were before they were converted for farming and other, other activities. All right. And here is the group releasing, again, the same photo we saw earlier um, at the um, main stem down right on, on Hills Range. Alrighty, so now we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to move down to the Todd Fishway and talk about the, the, the Lower Falls and the Todd Inlet. So the Fishway. So um, there was a dam that was built around, I don't know, 1915, I think, and it went right across the creek and it impounded water that was used for the cement plant that was down at the inlet. And then uh, Butcher Gardens um, inherited that through the, the whole process, and um, we witnessed fish not being able to get by, brought it to their attention. Butcher Gardens stepped up and paid for the construction of this step pool fishway um, and this, this structure here which allows the fish to get by and around the dam. The dam is back here and a very very old dam and it was decided not, instead of taking the dam out uh, it was decided we'd, we'd just build the fishway around it. So good on Butcher's Gardens for doing that and they got some press for it which was great and um, 
Here's the article. And that was in 2015. So when the fishway was constructed, it needed to be planted. And we are there right now with volunteers. Again, as you can see, it's a, often a family uh, uh, affair with multi-generations. So that's always fun. And now we have a picture of, the, of what's the camera box system. So the fish come up the fishway and through um, a hole in this concrete, the newer concrete um, uh, section that was built and um, during the fishway um, planning and construction. And what the idea was is that, is that this uh, box here, the fish come up through the fishway and then they're directed to go through this tunnel. And when they go through the tunnel, there's a, a motion uh, detection camera that goes off, takes a picture of them from above and from the side, and um, records it on a computer, which we, which we um, have stored securely on site. And uh, so that's been maintained by Brian Coval for the last well, five years now. And we find some things coming through. So this photo, uh, this uh, video is from the camera box. And this is a cutthroat trout we caught, we, we found going through twice. So we actually gave him a name because he had a chunk out of his back. And so we named him Chippy. And we recognized him the second time he came through. I said, wait a minute, I've seen that fish before. And uh, yeah, it was two weeks um, in between his, um, his trips through the camera going upstream. So here we've got another, um, another type of fish that came through. And it's a silver bright coho, about jack size, so that would be like a two-year-old if it had come back from the ocean. But we don't know that um, because it came through the camera box on April 1st. So April Fools, we got a fish that we were expecting in October, came through uh, in April. So what's with that? We stopped and figured out what the deal with that was. So that's a coho. You can see it was one of the hatchery fish that released because it doesn't have an adipose fin here. Okay. And we get some really interesting things. Um, uh, you never know what's going to come through the box. And this is really surprised us one day. So have a look at this. And that's pretty amazing. It's going for, oh, it's, it took a little breath there. And it is a, it's a good sized beaver. That is, that tunnel is a meter long and he is quite a bit over a meter. And look at the size of that tail. Wow, that's just fabulous. One thing you can notice is that uh, his passing through the tunnel actually uh, cleans some of the algae off the inside of the plexiglass, which uh, was a benefit, which we could get him to do that once a week and we'd be really good on maintenance. Anyway, so this uh, photo of this uh, fencing in the creek is above the dam and it's a pit array or a passive integrated transponder. So a pit tag is a tag that we um, uh, in, 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 embed into a fish's abdominal cavity at the hatchery. Um, the number is recorded and there's uh, it's a little glass a little glass cylinder about the size of a grain of rice and when that fish that has it if it goes through that array it's recorded on a computer so we know that what number it was we also know where that fish was released and when it was released so its survival to come through the pit tag array and be recorded lets us know whether um, the releases at one site were better than another site or the timing of the release was better or not. So that's, that's good science information to know to help inform future releases. And we did get lots of tags coming through. Well, interestingly enough, uh, one of the fish that we tagged ended up in the Cowichan River and there's a pit tag program there and it completely flummoxed the DFO people that were running that uh, pit tag array because a number sequence came up that went Oh, wait a minute, a fish came through that had a pit tag, but it's not our pit tag. So they finally figured it out where it was. It was one of our fish that had gone to couch and interesting stuff. All right, so we have the lower falls here. Now, <clears throat> the lower falls is not that much of a barrier. Fish can 
They can uh, go coming back and jump and jump and jump. Cutthroat trout would go through this, no problem at all. Um, but there is some other uh, issues with um, some of the rock formations and falls um, uh, upstream of, of this. So this project on Todd Creek hasn't isn't new. In the 1980s, a fellow called Ron DePaul, uh, also known by you know from him uh, starting or running Russell Books downtown for many many years, Ron was uh, one of the original Todd Creek stewards. Um, he got had a group called the Todd Creek Enhancement Society. Um, they pressured CRD to not dump their leachate straight into Todd Creek, but rather to build a pipeline back to Victoria um, because then it would be pushed out the outfall there and set up into the freshwater uh, system of Todd Creek and then into Todd Inlet and Saanich Inlet. So um, Ron DePaul started a lot of this and then um, around, well, this is in 2000, a group um, called Circa, which were some uh, fishermen that had their licenses retired and were doing uh, habitat work. And they worked with an engineer to build a step pool here in Middle Falls. You can see um, this fellow here is uh, lifting a large rock into place. This formed a jump pool to help the fish get up, up uh, to this section. This, these pipes are actually, uh, this hose is part of a hydraulic fracking system. So just like they do fracking for oil and gas um, recovery, this is a, a method of breaking rock using water, water pressure. This worked because adult salmon were seen for the next several years upstream, but they couldn't get past the dam. So, um, but since then, this wall has been knocked down. Some trees came down in this uh, area. So we're looking at, at this again with an engineer in the next couple of weeks. Um, the same engineer that built the fishway at Todd Creek and also at uh, our, new, our new fishway out at Millstream Creek. So work to be done yet. So uh, here we go. This is the Middle Falls again. This is a, fo this is a, a recent photo of that Middle Falls area. That... Um, that wall the fellow was building, they were standing right here and those lines were sort of staking up and around there. So one of the things will be uh, necessary is to build a, st a step here. So it might be concrete, it may be rock, I don't know, um, a way of getting the fish um, into a pool and upstream. Here's a great photo of, of, of men at work. Uh, this is Sydney anglers. Um, they're always up for an activity like this. Um, there's Grant McPherson, Ken Clements, and Rick Brand. And they're removing a stick jam. And these stick jams uh, develop in, in places like this because Todd Creek is a ravine. And if you've got big material coming down like this, smaller material catching up on the upstream side, and then the sticks filling in, um, it can actually get a, a blockage that fish either can get through or they get slowed up. And if they get slowed up, that makes them more vulnerable to predators like otters. So if they can move through the system as quick as possible, that's, that's the best thing for them. All right, so now we're going to talk about Todd uh, Inlet. So uh, probably Mid Falls was about this area here. Lower Falls is about there. And this is Todd Inlet, and this goes right out into Saanich Inlet, Brentwood Bay. This is Butchard Gardens and uh, the parking lot, and this is where the cement plant used to be. So now we're going to talk about uh, the, this area. So there we have a picture of uh, Todd Inlet with its Sinchatha name of Sneakwith. Um, and Nikki Wright, who's executive director of Sea Change Marine Conservation Society uh, is addressing the students from Bayside that are part of our Creatures of Peninsula Streams Creatures of Habitat program. So Nikki's explaining a little bit about the history of, of, of Sneakwith, how important it was to First Nations. It was a, a winter overwintering camp. Um, it was the place of the blue grouse. That's what Sneakwith means. So there's lots of blue grouse there. So uh, Nikki and her team of volunteers, staff, and um, board members have done an amazing job of uh, invasive species removal, uh, native plantings, 
um, all in the Stinkworth area and onto the beach. So here's the students out with uh, other volunteers and they're uh, being shown, um, uh, being told about what they're going to be doing in their activity. Our Creatures of Habitat program um, provides the opportunity for uh, grade 6, grade 7 students from the middle schools in Greater Victoria uh, to get out and uh, do some active work in the environment and learn at the same time. And it's a very successful program. Um, uh, everybody, everybody loves it, and the Earth uh, gets some love too. All right. So, and here's a little bit more instruction going on down at Sneakwith. Now, Todd Creek Beach Nourishment Project. So, uh, in 2016, uh, Nikki had um, uh, arranged for some funding to do restoration on the beach. Now, I should mention that this area is part of a BC park, so there's lots of people that come down to the beach. The old beach was um, uh, degraded, had slag and sludge, there's nothing living on it. Um, we did some testing and found the back shore materials had, uh, contam was contaminated with heavy metals. So the beach, the, the material that had been leaking onto the beach for years had been contaminating the beach. So the plan was to um, fix that up and restore the beach. So um, uh, you can't see it now, but underneath, this is where the beach was. This area was scraped clean of the, of the old slag material and it was taken down about a half a meter. And that material was uh, stockpiled for later use, uh, sorry, for later disposal properly disposed of. Um, you can see we used a barge to bring the gravel in from seashell and it's delivered onto the beach by a conveyor belt and then distributed by excavator. So it took us basically 24 hours to do the whole thing and lo and behold this is the end result. So there's the beach now. It's utilized um, extensively by people. The public love it. And I think huge kudos to Sea Change for making this happen. And there's Nikki um, doing what she does best, and that's teaching. She's a mentor, she's a leader, and has a huge heart for the environment. And if you want to know more about the Sea Change Beach Restoration Project, you go to YouTube, um, or just, uh, I think if you just did a Google search on that name, you, you could, um, you'll find it. Anyway, uh, that's the end of the presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. I'd just like to say that, uh, I'd like to say again, thanks to all our partners and supporters from Saanich to Red Barn to Pacific Salmon Foundation. They do a, a lot for us. They support just about every project we do. They're, they're a big contributor. So big shout out to Salmon Foundation. And of course, the Sydney Anglers and and the other friends groups that we um, we uh, have as part of Peninsula Streams. All right, so now um, we just the last little plug. Um, Peninsula Streams set up a legacy fund which generates interest uh, that then is uh, provides an annual uh, stipend to Peninsula Streams for us to carry on work. So, if you're so inclined um, to donate in someone's memory just to donate or in your will, if you could think of us, that would be great because that will help us and the people that will come after uh, me and, and my staff to do these great, these great um, um, activities for the environment well into the future. So, so thank you. And that's it. Now I think we're going to go in and we're going to take questions. All right. You didn't cut that out. Oh. So, right. But I exited that. Hi, everyone. I uh, hope you enjoyed the webinar. Um, so, questions. We've got one that's come in. It says, it's great to see all of the important work getting done. How do you decide which issues to tackle first and assign priority? I imagine, like most conservation restoration work, there's more to be done than funds or manpower allow at once. 
Pretty good question. Um, sometimes the funding is directed to projects that the funder wants to have happen. Um, if there's ones that want more volunteer components to it, we will look for projects with more volunteers. If we're looking for fish value or fish habitat value, we might uh, do more habitat projects. On uh, Todd, there's multiple issues, so it's kind of take your pick. We've been trying to deal with fish accessibility and movement within the watershed. Um, and again, we've got some work to do in the in the Mid Falls area. And um, but preparing the habitat upstream is always important because there is cutthroat trout, sea run, and resident which are utilizing um, that uh, enhanced habitat right now. Great, thanks. Next question. What are your thoughts about the beaver population in the watershed and how do they impact your plans and projects? Wow, that's a really good question because beavers are becoming more and more prevalent in our streams in Greater Victoria. Um, beavers are known to be great habitat modifiers. And for the case of salmon, they're actually uh, good because they make ponds and um, uh, redirect water and, and impound water, which becomes rearing areas, um, and fish generally can migrate um, past them. Unfortunately, in built environments like we have in uh, urban areas, like like we are, and and Todd is an urban area. Whenever they build their dams, which they really like to do a lot, there's the danger of back flooding um, private property, whether it's farmland or actually someone's uh, residents or roads. So I think that we need to come up with more ways of living with the beavers by building um, uh, structures that allow water to pass the beaver dams without um, uh, the beavers blocking it up so we get flow going through, but also look at uh, fish access um, at the same time. So yeah, it's an ongoing issue. Um, have any coho managed to get upstream and successfully spawn? Not, uh, no coho have, have actually gotten upstream and successfully spawn. We would know um, if there was significant numbers of adults coming back or any adults, as a matter of fact, because of the fact we operate that camera. So to this date, no, but there was um, uh, coho found upstream decades and decades ago. So. Sea run cutthroat? Uh, well, sea run cutthroat, yeah, Brian just, just pointed out. Sea run cutthroat do go up and uh, successfully spawn, but not coho. Okay, great. Um, next question, there was one that came up on the screen. Um, uh, Francesca, you put that one back up. I was looking chat. Okay, uh, what what work is planned for Todd Creek Watershed this year? Well, our plans for Todd Creek this year are to focus on the the the, the area below the fishway. So um, getting an engineer and getting engineer support and doing a, a significant plan to improve um, coho access upstream. So that's, that's what we're uh, planning for this year. And then that, that planning and would be turned into a uh, major activity in the park uh, for 2022. So, uh, as, as we'll do so, yeah. Okay, uh, do we have any others? There's, I've got one Q and A right here. What does this say? Oh, okay. So, where's the phone come from in Todd Creek? Is it runoff? Is it harmful? Well, that's a really good question. We get questions about foam all the time. Um, uh, for the most part, the foam is naturally derived from fatty acids that come from the breakdown of organic material. So as 
vegetation, leaves, etc., rot. They release the, the fatty acids. When the water goes over a waterfall, it 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 um, um, the fatty acids are sort of related to soap in a way, and that's why the the foam forms. We have had situations though where the foam is really white and really big, and that's usually from somebody washing their car or something similar um, entering the stream. But for the most part, it's natural. Okay. Might be it. I think that might be it. <clears throat> so, uh, oh, I think I just had another one. Hang on, yeah. Oh, okay, further about the CRD um, uh, leachate. Okay. So I it was before my time, but my understanding was is that the, the 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 leachate water from uh the landfill used to go through uh Heels Lake or he, the stream from Heels Lake and into the main stem and then downstream to Todd. And it was um, fairly intense lobbying by the Todd Creek Watershed Group at the time um, that uh, basically got the CRD to invest significantly on a, on a, on a line to um, take that, take that uh, leachate away back to Victoria. Um, oh, tire dust. Yes, I have seen the tire dust um, research and there's been lots of webinars on that lately. And this is uh, uh, something that is evident in urban creeks. Um, we haven't seen the pre-spawning mortality in creeks like Colquitts yet. Um, I hope not to see it um, because it's in pretty well every tire on earth. It's going to be years before they find a UV stabilizer to replace the, 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 um, the compound that's causing the issues. So it appears that one of the best and, and only ways we can deal with this is road runoff needs to be treated through soils. So rain gardens and other types of wetlands that intercept stormwater coming from roads would do a lot to attenuate that um, compound that causes the pre-spawning mortality in adult coho. Well, um, uh, another question about the long-term protection of Todd Creek Flats and whether it's in a protected status right now or we're dependent on the land for landowners uh, right now, it's it's like that. It's in a limbo. There've been much, many plans put forward by Mary Haig Brown and her group over the years, working with Saanich, uh, coming up with solutions. We were very close to uh, conservation status at one point, but um, that didn't uh, bear fruit. Hopefully, at some point in time in the near future, the uh, Todd Creek Flats will get um, uh, in, into a protected status. And um, yeah, and we do some more enhancement on it. That's it. Um, that's it, okay. Well, I'd just like to uh, uh, say to everyone, thank you for joining in and participating today. I hope you learned a little bit about it. If I forgot your name or uh, didn't put your shout out to Lori Derry and uh, anybody else that I've, I didn't, um, uh, didn't remember, but uh, thank you all. We couldn't do what we do without the staff, the volunteers, and the board members of Peninsula Streams. So, um, on that note, don't forget that we have uh, we have memberships, and memberships are important for demonstrating the depth of support in our community, which also helps us get funding to spend on Greater Victoria habitats uh, in the watersheds and near shore marine ecosystems. So on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Brian again. Thanks. We'll see you again at the next webinar.
All right, and I'd just like to thank our sponsors once again, our partners and other supporters of the work that's being undertaken in the Todd Creek Watershed. And they include the Friends of Todd Creek Watershed, the Friends of Malpey Lake Watershed Society, Sea Change Conservation Society, uh, BC Community Gaming Grants, the Sydney Anglers, Pacific Salmon Foundation, uh, Red Barn Market, uh, the Goldstream Salmon, or sorry, the Goldstream Volunteer Salmon Enhancement Association, uh, the Butcher Gardens, uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, Department of National Defense, District of Saanich, as well as BC Parks. Again, thank you for tuning in today, and we hope to catch you at the next one. Bye now.